we're so lucky to be alive at this moment in time, to be at this point, right? It, to be in a, in a wild, secular adoption of a technology and a, be around the epicenter of it, it's just amazing. Jack, welcome to Real Vision. Thanks for having me on. I'm a uh, longtime listener, first time caller, I guess you could say. <laughs> Fantastic. Look, um, I'd love, as ever, to give a, what you do today, and then we'll go back, and I want to hear your journey, because everybody's journey is different, and I think it's always important to find out what was the trigger points, how did you get here, and everything. So give people a bit of an idea of what you do now. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a research analyst for Fidelity Digital Assets. We can talk a little bit about uh, Fidelity Digital Assets and what we do, who we support, um, if, if that's helpful. But yeah, we'll come in. We'll come into Fidelity once we have got your journey. When you arrive at Fidelity, we'll we'll talk through what you guys are doing because obviously we've had a lot of the people from Fidelity on. It's always been great. So yeah, so so I'm a research analyst for Fidelity Digital Assets. Really, we provide support for for the most part uh, traditional investors that are looking to make allocations in the digital asset space or some of them are just interested in what are we doing in this space? Why do we care about it? Uh, they still are at the, the step one of this is magic internet money and it, you know you can copy Bitcoin and there's no difference between Bitcoin and Dogecoin. <laughs> when in reality, if you, if you dig a few layers deeper, uh, the education piece I think is a huge key. That's where we come in and play a role for our existing clients, uh, potential future clients um, to provide really a, a resource on the education and thought leadership front around Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and the digital asset space at large. How did you start in your journey into crypto? Yeah, I mean, I like to say I was predisposed to uh, looking at Bitcoin and digital assets. I studied finance and economics at school, uh, and specifically alternative investments and macroeconomics. And so like, what sits right at the, the sort of center or intersection of, of those two subjects is, is Bitcoin and digital assets. So I went through sort of different phases in college. I, I graduated in 2020. So uh, really thinking about like valuation and studying sort of some of the greats, the you know, Buffett, Graham Dodd, uh, the classics. And then from there, going a, a little bit of a layer deeper and saying uh, some of the Joel Greenblatt thoughts of can we quantify that, right? Factor investing you know, buy cheap and, and buy high quality. And we could look at factors instead of all of this valuation brain damage. And then from there, um, I was writing a, a thesis around the value trade and thinking about sort of macro um, and things like weren't adding up for me, right? When, it, when I think of like the framework of a world from like 1980 through, I mean, you could say 2020 now, but at the time it was maybe like 2017, uh, a world where interest rates kind of just go straight down in a linear line. Uh, as a result, the cost of capital coming down, equity multiples go straight up. Uh, the system never truly deleverages because every single time policymakers step in and it's it's bigger than ever and it's more coordinated than ever. Um, and starting to like put those puzzle pieces together uh, with the, the dollar as a reserve currency going on nearly 100 years and reserve currencies only last 100 years. And then you look at Bitcoin. Right. And it, it's sort of uh, diametrically opposed, completely different system. And I like to say, even if you ask someone, the average person, like I have you know, two sisters, how does a financial system work or how does the dollar work? They describe something that sounds a lot more like Bitcoin than it does the dollar system. Right. Because and you could ask 10 economists how the dollar system works and you get 10 different answers. Right. There, I guess there's right. no right answer there. Um, but that, to me, is what ultimately got me interested in the space. Started at Fidelity in prime brokerage, actually. And, and that was in 2020. And that was when, uh, you know, crypto markets are, are still a relatively inefficient market relative to traditional finance. But even take it back two or three years, even more inefficient. And there's regulatory arbitrage and, and different arbitrages that hedge funds that maybe don't have a fundamental view on the asset class, but they see the premium on the grayscale funds. And they see that as a potential arbitrage uh, or, or neutral trade that they can make. Um, the, the futures curve at CME, right? There, there were different trades, the carry trade there. Um, and I was just the person that wouldn't shut up about, about digital assets. And eventually, if you're loud enough about something, uh, you get connected to the right people. And so I've been over here for about two, two and a half years in this role. Amazing. So, you know, we've had obviously Tom Jessup on. We've had a lot of people on from Fidelity. Um, Yuri and Tim has been on as well. 
your journey of talking to clients, you're getting them at different stages in their knowledge journey. Yeah. Um, and you kind of alluded to that. Where do you think people are now when you speak to them? Where's the level of openness and understanding? Or is it still, I don't know why you're on this call, Jack. I've got no interest in you or anything you're talking about. Where, where do you think you are on that scale right now? I would say even over the last two years, uh, A, the conversation changes based on where prices are. Right, so momentum is in, in behavior. It doesn't just impact retail; it certainly impacts institutional investors. Uh, and the conversation is different. And they want to talk about Solana, Luna, and Avalanche in 2021. And now nobody asks about. I mean, nobody can ask about Luna now, or, or, or nobody <laughs> wants to talk about Avalanche, or very few are asking about Solana. It's all Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and there's something to be said for that, right? Where the market moves and, and people correspond. And I guess that's what makes a market. And that's why prices are where they are. And you see the consolidation that you have. Um, but even over the past two years, just seeing uh, the questions before really were the vast majority were the basic entry level questions of just like, tell me what, explain to me why this isn't magic internet money. And I'm going to not fight you the whole call, but I'm going to be very skeptical during the whole call. Um, and that was a lot of the, the conversations. Um, now, more recently, that's a lot less of the conversation. There, there's a lot more uh, discussion around, okay, uh, there, there's quite a few people and, and clearly Fidelity has continued to like double down in the space. And maybe I, I already work with the firm on the traditional side and have had a good, uh, had a good experience and you know, have some level of respect for the firm. So now I'm, I'm intellectually curious and I want to know why I might be wrong rather than before kind of taking the stance uh, of these foolish people for in the digital asset space, right? It, it, none of it makes sense, right? It's more uh, rather than skeptical, it's curious if you're at the beginning point and more broadly, like there is a, a better level of education uh, where people have just started to take the time uh, on the education front. And you can tell that. So less of the very beginner level conversations uh, and more sort of deeper into the space as well. Yeah, I mean, in my conversations with institutions, family offices and other larger players, most have done the work now. Yeah. You know, I, I just get the feeling that those who are interested have done a lot of work and now it's a matter of price. So then they want to stay on top of the space. They kind of want to understand. And then they want to know, when do I really need to allocate capital to that? Is that the kind of impression you get as well? That and also, I think, naively, before I stepped into this role, uh, I had the view that like, when you say the institutions are coming, that it's like they flip a switch and you know, they, they decide tomorrow to, to allocate or something. That is not at all the case. And like even today, there are very few actual like what we would call institutions of endowments, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, um, foundations that are actually owning tokens. Like some of them that are interested in the space will go the venture route because it's a, the yeah, traditional it's, wrapper. It's and then they can also more so pitch like the idea of blockchain and they're getting broad based exposure rather than taking true token asset ownership risk. Um, and so that's still the case today. But the education cycle, like you're, I don't think you're at square one with that, again, that skeptical nature. It's more like, okay, now we're, we're up the education curve uh, for a lot of these people. And there's less questions of like, why does Fidelity care about it when all of these other traditional firms are now starting to make partnerships with crypto native firms or file for ETFs, et cetera. And so there's less skepticism that the space isn't going to be around in five and 10 years and more so thinking about, okay, maybe we're not allocated today, but how you know, we'll get there at some point maybe. And that's, that's largely what I've seen from the larger firms. And even like we do a, an annual survey and you can see it, the, the levels of adoption, the perception across what we consider to be institutional, like goes all the way down to delegated wealth managers. So like RIAs and family offices have higher levels of like overall positive perception. They're also closer to the end client, right? If you think of like a pension board or an endowment board, a lot of it is like these discretionary allocations because the end client is pounding the table and says, I want to own some Bitcoin and they don't have a fundamental view on it. They just need to find a solution. And so still like the, the big piles of money that have investment boards, they're all getting up the education curve. But I would argue most of them 
don't have you know true or meaningful allocations to the space today. Hey everyone, Rouse Venture and Crypto, it's really my flagship show. It's where I interview the best guests in the world, people you never get on another show. I think it's the best show in macro, crypto, and Web3 combined. In fact, that's what it does. It covers everything. But really, it's all about the revolution in Web3 and crypto. And I'd love it if you got it every week in your inbox. All you have to do is just click on the link below, pop in your email address, and you'll get notified every time it comes out. And you don't miss anything as you take my journey into the exciting new world of crypto and Web3. Thanks. Have, have you, I mean, a while ago, I don't know if you ever saw it, I got together, one of our Real Vision members used to build kind of asset allocation risk models for Barra or somebody like that, or, and for, yeah. for BlackRock or Blackstone. And I got him to do it, to put Bitcoin into a traditional portfolio. Have you started going through that again with clients to say, listen, that there is a diversification. Last year was a weird year because every single asset on earth went down. Um, but generally speaking, over time, even with small allocations, it makes a huge difference. It, it actually lowers your risk and increases your, your return. Yeah, there was, uh, there was somebody, not, not at Fidelity, but externally, and we caught uh, wind of like the paper and the story, um, and, and maybe you're familiar or not, but they were showing uh, a hedge fund, and they just called it, you know, whatever, hedge fund XYZ, and they just showed the return stream and the performance over time. They're showing it around to you know, all the fellow uh, analysts or whatever at their firm and kind of externally, and it was Bitcoin. And everybody was like, oh, this is a great diversifier and a really interesting asset. And then when they heard it was Bitcoin, they were like, oh man, you got me, right? Because it, you, you know, it's just, you know, you have that, uh, that perception or view on the asset without even you know, digging into the data, right? Every, it, it brings out sort of like either a, a vile hatred for the asset because it, it has no fundamentals or, or no cash flows for, for Bitcoin, or, you know, you love it and you think it's going to change the world tomorrow when in reality, you know, there's, there's somewhere in between and there's a happy medium and we should look at the data. Yeah, it's weird. People come with narrative biases with things that are new because they don't like them, they don't fit in, because they're like, I'm a commodity guy, or I'm an equity guy, why should I care about this thing? I can't value it in the same way. Yeah. So that narrative bias is so strong, it's really interesting. Once you take that away, they're like, yeah, this looks great, we should buy some of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So the one big issue that I find is when you think about um, portfolio construction, most of the people making those decisions, especially when you get to larger institutions, they want so they want historical data and on Bitcoin, you got to argue where's the starting point, right? When was yeah. the asset liquid enough? And oftentimes they'll use, you know, so some go back to 2015 when we've done reports, we've like 2015 and sometimes you see 2018. Well, 2018 was the start of the CME futures market. And so that's where you get the, the argument there. But if you use Jan 2018, you're using the, the peak top of the, the 2017 cycle, right? So you're necessarily biasing the data one way or another based on the, the starting point. So arguably you should be, you know, use a sensitivity range for your starting point, whatever. But then the problem is people will say, well, it's only five years of data and we're used to CRISPR data sets to go back to 1932 or what it, whatever it is, right? We can use, uh, you know, all of these indices that go way back. And with Bitcoin, it's like, okay, anything that goes from being worth nothing, being literally a, a, an idea in a white paper to being worth something, it's going to have incredible returns. But the law of large numbers, we know that the, the returns are going to be diminishing. It's just a mathematical fact unless it eats the entire world. Um, and so at that point, you need to have a fundamental thesis to make an allocation in order to think about like, like black Litterman portfolio modeling of like having future return assumptions and then baking that into a portfolio. But most of them use historical like equities will give you 7% and then we'll use yield on treasuries to, to get an idea of what the you know, four or 10 year returns on treasuries are, whatever it is. But they don't want to make a fundamental statement on where Bitcoin or Ethereum or the digital assets are going. And so then it all falls apart because they say the backwards data is too short and it went from being worthless to being worth 500 billion, but that's never happening again. And we agree on that. But then when you start to talk about like, okay, Bitcoin could be a digital gold and gold is a $10 trillion market cap. And you start looking at the TAM and if we get there in 10 or 20 years, here's what the Kager could look like. 
that's where it all falls apart because then you have to have a fundamental investment thesis. And a lot of the portfolio modeling is too quantitative and academic to then make a return assumption going forward. Yeah, and also, I mean, the reality is even if you took somewhere near the bear market lows, it's like a hundred and something percent a year returns. Um, yeah. For, yeah. And nobody wants to believe it. So they're, they're kind of like, well, we can't put that in the model. Yes. I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're using kind of bear market to bear market. So you're not using bear market trough to market peak or anything like that. It's pretty consistent. But then people don't want to do it because it seems so ridiculous compared to all other asset classes that they, they're like, well, it can't be too. It can't be so. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite things that I've actually seen, you know, you mentioned Urian and I know, you're, you know you guys are familiar with each other. He's done uh, just the risk adjusted analysis, right? And you, you actually end up, I mean, this was probably a year ago when he had pulled it. And you know, any, anybody here, if you kind of know sharp ratios, you could pull the data yourself. But if you look at the sharp ratio on Bitcoin, because the vol is so high, you actually come back with an asset that is realistic in terms of returns because the return was really high, but the vol was really high. And on a risk adjusted basis, it's actually very similar to a 60-40 portfolio. It's just you jack both of those metrics up to get the same risk adjusted return. So that actually, to me, is not too good to be true because you have the, the offsetting vol piece That's right. alongside it. But like you said, when you say, oh, this thing could return 50% a year, it starts to so sound super outlandish when anything double digits on most assets is you know, it's an aggressive return assumption. Although hilariously, if you go to the same investor and say, I've got a VC investment and we think the fund can produce 50% a year. They said, yeah, fine. That sounds more than reasonable. It's like, it's very funny. It's the anchoring no volatility bias. volatility either, Raul, right? With zero volatility. It's the market it's magic. Uh, once a quarter, right? So where are we now? Where, what's your, where are you thinking we are with Bitcoin and then the overall crypto markets overall? So, so it's a good question. As you know, I'm, I'm ludicrously bullish right now, and I have been for a while, but let's see, see what you think. So I've heard some of that. So it's a little intimidating coming in here, not, uh, maybe not being at the same exact level at the moment. But, um, but I guess my, my honest take is I think that the, uh, I'll explain it this way, the endogenous variables, if you look at the charts, right, the price charts, the on-chain data that we follow, the historical analogs, I mean, it's hard to look at the culmination of all of that and look at sort of prior cycles, knowing that you know, history is not a predictor of the future, but it can be a good guide to you know, what a base case scenario could be. And it looks, it would be indicative or suggestive that November was a bottom. And of course you had failures and uh, the space guts a black eye. Um, and it kind of all makes sense that you were below the 200 week moving average more than you had ever been historically. Um, so, so you lost important support levels. Now you've recovered above them, that that was the bottom and we're in a reaccumulation period. And like, if you look historically, what have the cycles been around Bitcoin? We all know sort of the, I'll assume everybody knows the, the four year having cycle, right? And whether or not you believe it's because of the four year having cycle, or I've even heard you talk about, and something we've looked at is global liquidity cycles. And it just so happens that because Bitcoin was born out of the financial crisis, that like you've had kind of this, three to five year time period or four years, give or take, where central banks have been easing at the same time as Bitcoin has its having. And so two coincidental things happening at once, you know, more US dollars and less issuance of Bitcoin at the same exact time kind of has a, you know, whichever one you want to think has more of an impact uh, doesn't really matter. But I think you add all of the, the on-chain data and the historical analogs, it's hard to to be super bearish, right? It feels like we're in a reaccumulation period. Historically, you get a one year sharp drawdown from these cycles from the tops. That was November 21 through November 22. Now you go for, I mean, historically it's a year of kind of chop and volatility and we're halfway through that. And there's an upward bias there. I mean, there was in the, the prior cycle as well. I believe the, the 2018 into 2019 time period, you start to see a little bit of an upward bias. And we're up 100% from the bottom, right, at 30,000 as we're speaking. But we're still down 50% from the all-time high because you got to go up 300% when you go down 75%, right? So I think there's maybe a, in the short term a little bit of an upward bias. Um, and underneath the surface, I think that there's like maturation of the infrastructure that is much needed. Like you see traditional players kind of stepping in and doing things, building exchanges or partnering with, with different firms. I think that's a good sign for the long term. And we washed out a lot of highly leveraged 
poorly risk managed crypto natives. It's not to say that there aren't crypto natives that will be really important in the long term. I think there will be. But traditional finance coming in, I, I don't think is a bad thing if what you're worried about is like the long term price movement of this asset class and capital flowing into it. But to me, that's all the the kind of endogenous like people looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum and like actually using them or actually buying and hoarding Bitcoin. That's all kind of happening or we have evidence of that. I think there's exogenous variables that I just don't know where they're going. On the macro front, that's this is one of the things that maybe potentially gives me pause is just I think there's a lot of smart people on both sides of the trade. Some that are saying the Fed's gone too far, right? They're, they were too hawkish at the wrong time. And now we're on the other side of this and uh, you have commercial real estate and regional banks uh, under pressure and all of that might come to a head at the end of the year. And on the other side, you have like the, the inflation is sticky camp. If you look at core PCE that takes out the volatile components like energy and, and food, uh, well, that's not coming down as quickly. Uh, and you're also like at a, at a point in time, we just had the June release uh, today as we're talking for CPI. You rolled off a very hot month in June 2022 and picked up June 2023, obviously, as a month over month. You got a 3% number. Can you get back down to 2% or are you going to be kind of in limbo from 3 to 4%? And then what does that mean for nominal yields? Because I think of like Bitcoin as 50% of the space is a key driver to all of digital assets, they all kind of have a beta to Bitcoin and Bitcoin's an alternative money. We call it a digital gold as an easy framing. Well, what matters to gold? Forward real rates, right? For You can look at 10 year tips is the one I use. And there's there's been this relationship that's kind of broken down this year. If the relationship comes back, forward real yields are you know a lot higher than they would suggest where Bitcoin should be trading. So I think just a little bit of exercising caution when there are a lot of unknowns on the macro side is one thing, and that's an exogenous variable. Uh, one bullish exogenous variable is the the series of ETF filings, right? Renewed optimism and sentiment around surveillance sharing agreements, trying to you know, sort of appease what the, the SEC is looking for uh, in terms of trying to prevent market manipulation, right? The, the two key concerns that they've had uh, have been custody of these assets because they're bearer assets. I think Many would, would argue that we're at a point where, you know, there are a number of, of reputable, you know, competitive custodians in the United States at this point uh, that are regulated. And now if we have these surveillance sharing agreements, maybe that appeases you know, sort of the other issue concerns around, you know, spot market uh, manipulation and, and trading or transparency, lack of transparency there. So that is uh, an exogenous variable that, that could add as an upside catalyst. It's just hard to predict or know uh, what's going to happen there. Um, and then the last one to me is, did we you know, wash out all of the offshore entities that are heavily influential to this space uh, that are unstable, poorly risk managed or highly leveraged? And I don't know if that's the case. And, you know, there are a number of you know, sort of reports and news items surfacing that, you know, just make you pause and say, hmm. And uh, last time, uh, maybe we weren't saying that enough. And so I just kind of exercise caution. So to me, the, the, the upside catalyst is, is ETF potentially. And then sort of the, the potential downside catalyst could be uh, on the macro side or uh, more to come in terms of these entities that weren't very sustainable in the crypto space. Yeah, on the macro side, when I look at it, even if let's say you're right and when well, you're not saying either way, but let's yeah. say the inflationists are right and inflation sticky three to 4%, which is, well, where do rates go from there? They either stay the same or they come down a bit. Okay, we can argue that. So the rate of change can't, won't continue. And I think it's the rate of change that matters. Because when you go back and look at, you know, as we all do, we can look at charts of rates or charts of, uh, yeah, ch charts of rates versus Bitcoin, and you can see the periods, even when periods when the balance sheet wasn't growing and wasn't shrinking, the Fed balance sheet, what you find is crypto goes up. Because like it's a secular cycle that you can't keep down. So I always say it's like holding a beach ball underwater, is the moment you just stop the rate of change of rate rises, you take the foot off the beach ball and it comes exploding out of the water every time. Now, what are you th what are you looking at in terms of Adoption. So price is one thing, right? It's a measure of the value of the network. 
But that network value is made up of a number of components, like the activity on chain and the number of people. How are you looking at the kind of on chain at a more macro level and thinking, okay, how does this go from here to the next five years? Or even this cycle, how would this cycle evolve? Let's assume we're in this normal cycle, which is weird because we all know there's a cycle. It's pretty obvious. Yep. It should be the easiest thing in the world, but yet it's so difficult for people because everyone gets shaken out in the bear market and gets over-optimistic in the bull markets. It's, it's bizarre, even though it's such an obvious cycle. But anyway, let's talk about that next three years going out, assuming that the cycle is on its way and we're somewhere around crypto spring. What changes here now? So I'd like to say the regulatory landscape would start to change because I think that's, I mean, outside of Bitcoin, uh, that's the thing that I think Ethereum and smart contract platforms need, which is to be able to tether themselves to real world assets. I mean, sure, we can, you know, you could put NFTs in, in Web3 and that whole sort of community aspect into one bucket. Um, but I think the tokenization of real world assets is kind of the big kicker. But for for like what is going to make Ethereum uh, and, and other smart contract platforms relevant is being able to be tethered to relevant real world assets that matter and allow you to trade them, borrow against them, utilize them more efficiently, more accessibly, uh, regardless of where you are in the world. That's where I think Bitcoin is just kind of structurally different and they're different trends, right? In my view, and I, I think kind of in our view from a research standpoint, Bitcoin's trying to be a monetary asset and it makes trade-offs to do that, right? It makes decentralization and security trade-offs, uh, but it's, you know, it lacks complexity or capabilities that these other platforms allow you to do. There's beauty in that to some degree. And then there's also like opportunity for other platforms. Um, so, so Bitcoin doesn't really need the, the regulatory landscape to change all that much to kind of keep doing what it's doing. And if we, if you kind of ask the question of like, what matters on chain? Well, I think of, you know, what's the value proposition of a monetary asset or an aspiring monetary asset? Store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account. It's kind of a gradient, right? Store of value would be the, the first obvious one, 21 million Bitcoin. And because of like the block size wars and trade-offs that Bitcoin has made, just to, to never change, right? Just to try to be as decentralized as possible, which you can say it's good, you can say it's bad, whatever you want. Um, but that furthers the, the store of value first argument. And if you look on chain, less Bitcoin have moved in the last year than ever before. 70% of the supply hasn't moved in the past year. That's consistent with prior cycles. I, I shot over some charts, so, so maybe we can pull up the, the Bitcoin uh, liquid versus illiquid supply, but we're seeing similar accumulations to prior cycles, which is price goes down and there's a set of agnostic accumulators that don't care about the price and you know, oversimplifying, but they think about things on a five and 10 year time horizon. Is there any other asset like that? Does gold do the same? Because it's such a... And I remember when Paul Tudor Jones was like, him and Stan Druckermiller were talking, they're like, there's these crazy idiots who 80% of them will ride through an 85% bear market and don't sell. He's like, what is this? It's more like a religion. Yeah, I mean, you could say that, that true gold bugs might act like this, but we don't have the... You know, I, don't, I don't know if we have the data to prove that, right? Because I've not, not a, seen the data. It's not a transparent ledger that, that we can audit in real time and pull apart the data. So f for me, like, I don't think Bitcoin needs much to happen. The, a Bitcoin ETF, of course, would be a positive catalyst, um, but it's going to kind of just keep doing what it's doing. And then, of course, the value proposition shines if and when interest rates come back in, liquidity gets added to the system. And like, if you look at the broader picture, I don't think we can have positive real rates for too long, right? It's, it's kind of just a math equation. If sovereign debt levels are where they are, unless global growth Impossible. spurs, uh, you know, some way that, that isn't expected, you're going to require debasement, right? In all likelihood, nothing's ever for certain, but there's a high probability that you just kind of have to debase currencies. If everyone's doing it on a relative basis, Sorry, my dogs are barking. If, it always happens to me, don't worry. It must be the man used here. to it. If, if everyone's debasing on a relative basis, maybe the dollar stays kind of where it is if you look at the Dixie, but relative to gold, relative to Bitcoin or scarce assets over a long span of time, like the value proposition of Bitcoin is clearly still there. Then if we pivot, yeah, yeah and, then, and then I would just say, if we pivot to the tech side, right, to, to Ethereum and to, to smart contract platforms, 
well, that's where I think regulation is going to be key. Are these securities, are they not? How do we treat them going forward in large developed countries that have lots of capital that could be willing allocators, but they need regulatory clarity to be able to allocate? That's a huge key, getting real world assets on chain so we're not just trading speculative tokens back and forth. Uh, that to me, that's the, the sort of next level there on that side. Yeah, I mean, I when I first got into Bitcoin 2012, 2013, that was the first use case. It's like the entire securities industry needs to go on chain. It's just going to make it so much more efficient. We haven't got there yet, but everyone's working towards it. You know, whether it's you guys or Franklin Templeton or Goldman or JP Morgan, I mean, everybody's working on this. They want to get there. The regulators kind of want to get there. If not, the UK will get there because their set of guidelines, you know, you've got this third set of property rights. It's not the physical rights, it's not the digital rights. The, what they've done for kind of digital assets is different. So they're giving you the rights, which now means your contracts are enforceable in certain ways. It, it's it's definitely getting there. The US is just murky, but they'll they'll find the con, you know conclusion. There's enough big players, sensible people who were trying to help it move along. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I think we'll get there eventually. I would just say, you know, it doesn't seem like we're there yet. But if you look, you know, if you look on chain on Ethereum, people are still using it. They're willing to pay fees, and ultimately, that's what matters for ETH, the asset. Right, because now ETH, after proof of stake, you're able to have the optionality to stake the asset and earn a, a cash flow, and there's a burn as well, like a, an automated buyback, and that's all dependent on people wanting to be willing to transact and pay fees on the network. More evidence on chain right now that that keeps on going, and again, we're not even there where there's not really much in the way of real world assets on chain yet to even transact in. Now, because um, Fidelity offers ETH as well to institutional clients and others. Have you found that there's an interest, thinking going back to the asset allocation conversation we have, a lot of people never liked gold because it didn't have a yield. And they don't like Bitcoin because it doesn't have a yield. Because if you stick it in an endowment, they want to have some positive carry. You know, it's just what they need. Are you finding that ETH gets um, narrative traction because it has a yield and kind of broadly represents the technology of the space? So it's the blockchain bet that makes it easy. You don't have to fight about the monetary system and, and say things that makes your boss think you're crazy. Yeah. But you're just saying, hey, listen, the technology's here and it gives us a nice yield. Are you seeing that narrative? Yeah, so I think you, you make a good point there where you kind of break down the investor type and even like internally working for Fidelity Digital Assets, I'm pretty agnostic to everything. I, I got interested in the space through Bitcoin, but yeah, you know, I see if the market thinks there's value there and there are people really using it, like there is a probability that there's value accrued there, right? I just, I think it might be a, a little bit more speculative, but if it's more speculative, that means the, you know, the risk return is different. Um, and owning, you can own both in a portfolio. So why do you have to make a, a statement on one necessarily? Things are, are tribal, but Crazy. even internally, like we have people that work here that are, Bitcoin maximalists. We have people that are ETH only and we have everything in between. It's, it's quite interesting, right? Um, but I, I think you made a point there around investors having interest in, in one or the other. Uh, and like you said, with Bitcoin, it's those that are looking at the monetary system, that are looking at debasement and quantitative easing, and they want to own Bitcoin in their portfolio to hedge against those types of things. I, I find that when we talk macro thesis with a lot of these folks, they tend to, in large part, agree with the bigger long-term picture that the average uh, rational Bitcoiner would maybe describe. Um, and, and then on, on Ethereum, it's the tech-minded investor, kind of like you're alluding to, where they see value in blockchain. Um, maybe they're not exactly sure like where it plays out because it is more of a, an open-ended question of, we know there's real technology here and there's real potential uses, but we can't exactly put our finger on the, the exact use case that's going to kind of elevate it into its next phase or its next step. That we we'll only know that narrative in hindsight and the price will have run uh, before that already happens, right? If, if it happens in the future. So it is two kind of different investor types, but there's the hybrids in between that want to own both. And maybe we were a little self-selecting in the fact that we only supported Bitcoin first for a number of reasons. One, building a business and keeping it simple and being really risk managed and compliance and legal focused. And then the regulatory environment has evolved and you know we built out the product to support Ethereum and, and now we're here supporting both. Um, 
But because we supported Bitcoin first, maybe that self-selected us to uh, have more uh, more of a client base that's interested in talking about Bitcoin as opposed to Ethereum. But things are things are constantly kind of shifting and changing. And also, you know, Bitcoin again at an asset allocation level is quite easy. Once people get over the hurdle of it, it's quite easy to put into a portfolio. You see what it is. It's kind of clear. It's, as you say, it's a very different thing. It's a bet on an ecosystem. It's like a big giant VC portfolio of everything that happens in Web3. Um, but unlike unlike VC, it comes with a yield. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So what, what pushback do you still get from people that surprises you? I mean, there's the usual pushback, but is there still like a what are we doing wrong here? What, why can't we get this narrative right that they don't understand something? I mean, the biggest one I would say was regulation or the biggest, like I would argue like the biggest excuse, like even somebody that maybe starts to get it, but then like from a firm perspective, they don't want to take any risk or, or allocate to the space. They would just say, well, the government could outlaw it. And like, you know, you can, you can reason with them all you want that it's global game theory. Look at the internet, look at, you know, these competitive uh, technologies that just can't be stopped. And like, you know, the United States is very unlikely to, to ban this, especially at this state, right? That becomes less and less likely every single day. And I think it's more, we hear that less, but two years ago, we heard the, the regulatory uh, question mark as the reason for not allocating. Um, I mean, now it's less and less. It's just through the bear market, there was less knocking on our door and now there's more knocking on our door. It's the same thing. It's price is the driver. And so if, if the end client isn't asking, I would argue maybe it's, maybe it's career risk is the right answer here is like, yeah. if all is well, if equities are performing, why do I have to own this thing that trades like three X levered NASDAQ, right? Or at least it did last year in the bear market, right? Now they're kind of diverging and there's a lower correlation and they, we do fundamentally think that Bitcoin is different than, uh, you know, than, than equities and even Ethereum is different than equities. But if everyone views them as high beta risk on assets, then everyone's going to trade them like they are. And then the allocator that's slightly skeptical of the space will just say, I'll just own equities. I don't have to take the career risk. And it, that's all slowly being peeled back. Um, but it's, it still exists, right? It's, you're still, uh, not everybody has come around on, on digital assets. It's slowly happening, but I would argue in, in delegated asset management, half the battle is not not being fired, right, by your LP or by whoever's money you're running. And so well, half the battle in life in general is not to be fired. Yes, it, exactly. And so if you're an allocator and you're not like super passionate and gung ho on the space, a lot of times you'll learn about it, but then you'll say, oh, we'll visit it later. Right. Because why do I have to? My 6040 is doing fine at the time. Now maybe that picture is starting to change. Maybe they are looking for the you know, return enhancer or the the hedge against their their fixed income portfolio, whatever it is. But those things just take time. Like we kind of had started uh, out by saying, is it doesn't happen overnight. But you're starting to see things happen underneath the surface and questions you know being asked. So what do you get excited about going forwards from here? What kind of areas are you looking at? Thinking that's looking interesting to me. What gets you excited? <sighs> Yeah, that's a, outside of price. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for me, like I, I like seeing the innovation taking place on like Ethereum. If you look at the L2 battles, right, you see uh, Arbitrum and, and Optimism as optimistic L2s. And that's kind of the existing technology that now you're seeing in terms of transaction count more days where there's more transactions on those platforms than there is on, on ETH L1. And so there's kind of this, you know, there's this battle that's going to brew or build between Ethereum using layer twos, and it starts with optimistic, and then there's promise of, of zero knowledge in the future that's supposedly coming. But again, it's kind of, you could argue uh, whether it's real or how much of it is, is, is all talk. And, and these optimistic rollups are already you know, actually pushing through transactions. But you have ETH defending itself against other smart contract L1s. At the same time, it kind of backs its monetary policy into trying to look more like Bitcoin in some ways. I mean, I know it's proof of stake and yield bearing, but they lower the issuance rate uh, on all of these hard forks over time. And then they add the burn mechanism. So now it's deflationary. So 
ETH in some way is defending itself against Solana and Cosmos with app chains with its L2s. It's backing its monetary policy into looking like something that wants to compete with Bitcoin on the monetary front. And then Bitcoin at the same time has lightning and we'll see where that goes and rumors of other L2s to be launched. Uh, so now Bitcoin is kind of encroaching to some degree in terms of scalability and functionality, trying to look a little bit more and we see ordinals taking off on Bitcoin, like look a little bit more like ETH's technology, like thesis, right? So the, the core value proposition of ETH is around tech and what you can build on it. Core value proposition for Bitcoin is around its monetary policy and it acting as a store of value, you know, aspiring money. Now they're encroaching on each other. Meanwhile, you have these other, like there's just so much going on that I think is really exciting to watch as we move forward. And hopefully the regulatory environment becomes more and more productive and, and we get more answers. I mean, we are going to by hook or by crook. It's either going to be Congress tells us or judges and lawyers figure this stuff out. And maybe it takes another five years plus uh, or maybe it's sooner. I'm hopeful it's sooner. But you have all this stuff going on within digital assets. You have the macro backdrop. We could talk about it all day. They're converging together. We're kind of sitting right at the center of all of it. Um, I don't know if that's enough for you there, but. Yeah, it is. You know, and what, you know, I've been wryly observing because, like most of my conversations around crypto, there's this like madness that we're dealing with from regulators to 80% bear markets to exchanges going bust and everything else. But yet everybody has a smile on their faces. It's like, it is the, it's so exciting and unique and interesting that you feel like, you know, where you are in your seat or me in my seat, we're so lucky to be alive at this moment in time, to be at this point, right? It, to be in a, in a wild, secular adoption of a technology and a be around the epicenter of it, it's just amazing. I completely concur. I, I know a lot of people that want to work in digital assets. I don't know a lot of people that work in crypto and digital assets that want to work in TradFi. And it's not to say anything bad about the traditional side, but it's, it's structure. It's the way it is. And it you know kind of continues on in the, the path that existed. Like I like to think like, I'm a research analyst in digital assets. Over the past two years, I've had so many cool opportunities with so many people. If I was an equity analyst, it's a, the structure has existed there for 50, 70 years, right? I wouldn't be talking to you if I was a, an equity analyst because I would be in the, the existing system uh, that you, know, you work your way up from whatever, this analyst to that analyst. Whereas here, it's like so much about our business has changed and we've three X in headcount over the past two years. And so, you know, the, the pitch to anybody here, uh, fidelidigitalassets.com, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, there's a careers tab. Uh, you don't have to be a researcher. We're a full fledged business that has operations, product, uh, compliance, you name it. I mean, you guys have been astonishing pioneers in this space, you know, and I've been, you know, on real vision following this story and gotten to know, uh, a lot of people at Fidelity really well. It's just astonishing to me what you guys have done. The other one that was astonishing is I got to know um, some people at Franklin Templeton. It's like, sounds like a boring asset management <laughs> firm. They're doing amazing stuff. And it's like, you know, that the reinvention is happening from within. Yeah. And it's not just a bunch of crypto native firms trying to change the world. They're trying to do that too. And some are succeeding, some are failing. But we're seeing the whole system change at its core. And we know that all the banks are involved in this. We know one by one, they're all coming. They're just pretending they're not. Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of conversations with, you know, A, we talked to Frank, uh, Franklin Templeton uh, down at Consensus. And, you know, and have you spent some time with Sandy? Sandy Cole. Not Sandy, but some folks from the research oh, team and some others me. down there. And yeah. again, like you said, they're, they're doing some really cool stuff. And there's a a lot of folks that we talk to at traditional firms where they're all looking at it, they're all paying attention to it, and you really can't turn a blind eye to it anymore. Um, I mean, I know credit at Fidelity goes all the way to the top of the house of pretty much unwavering conviction for like almost a decade now to just sort of know, further amazing. experiment and, and creep forward in this space. 
and now we're sitting right at sort of the intersection of, of TradFi and, and digital assets. So I'm excited to see where it, where we'll be uh, a couple of years from now. Fantastic. Jack, listen, thank you ever so much. It's been great to get you on. We'll definitely have you back on as we go through this journey. You know, when you've got some new ideas that you've been researching, you want to come and talk to us. We're always open for that. You know, we, we, you know we're with you on the journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. This was, uh, this was great. If anybody uh, wants to, our, our research, we distribute most of it uh, open source, fidelitydigitalassets.com backslash research. You can get on our, our sign up page. And I'm at J underscore new writer on Twitter, tweeting out uh, some things that we're seeing from our research desk on a pretty regular basis. Fantastic. We'll put that in the link as well. Thanks so much. Brilliant, Jack. Great to see you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. I love having these insights. We are so lucky to have people like Jack join us and give us a peek behind the curtain of the other side of crypto. You know, this is not the crypto of Twitter. This is not the crypto that uh, you spend in the evening in the pub talking about. This is where the real capital gets allocated or will get allocated. And these are the people who are onboarding the financial system into this alternative system. And Jack is out there telling that story and driving forward this space. And it's just fascinating to see where this all goes. Hey, visionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto. You'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise, get in-depth analysis, and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights.